Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Right out of the gate, my name is Eric, and Michael Kester, I'd like to ask you a question. All right, hit me. Uh, first question is, what are we doing on the show? Today, we're going to do My Bloody Valentine and Poltergeist. That's easy. All right, so it I had that is one. Easy. I had that one in the bag. Very easy. So, uh, for new listeners of our show, uh-huh. I'd like you to give me really just your honest opinion here. Okay. Do you think that our own studio, that we record double feature in this very studio we're now, do uh-huh. you think it is haunted? Well, our equipment breaks inexplicably. Uh huh. Uh, we seem to be bleeding funds at a rate that I Definitely. honestly cannot account for. Sure. And uh, food keeps just disappearing. No one knows where the producer Mysterious has been. Mysterious noises months. coming from nowhere. Yes. And we get sick every time we're in the studio. Yeah, that's also true. So absolutely fucking not. No chance then. That no. The studio Zero percent chance. Studio is haunted. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna second that opinion. We have two films, and, you know, I think we might have uh, vaguely alluded to this show as our slasher show. Whoops. I would still stand by that, and here's why. Okay. <laughs> My Bloody Valentine is enough fucking slasher movie for two films. I will hit, yeah, okay. Now, um, now Poltergeist is not a slasher film no, by any true. stretch of the imagination. But uh, we do have two horror movies, two right? Two 80s horror movies. You got it. And we are going to spoil both of them. Now, they've been around since the 80s, so I don't know. Maybe you know what happens in them. If you don't, you can use the chapters. You can skip over the part where we spoil the movies. It happened once. It happened twice. If you don't cancel the dance, it'll happen thrice. That is a a note from My Bloody Valentine. It's the worst. um, It's, I believe, the, uh, I I stated, the worst poem in the film. Yeah. The (laughs) fact that you have to qualify that is, there are many poems in the film. This is the worst of the poems in the film. Although I think I think runner up for worst poem in the film is you didn't stop the dance. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes you uh, you play a little more free verse there. <laughs> you and I can pick on my bloody Valentine because we adore it. Oh my god, it is It is often considered one of the best slasher films of all time. Yeah. I mean, make no mistake and about that. And we do a lot of slasher shit on we Double certainly Feature. Do. We certainly do. But we haven't uh, we haven't visited that good true 80s stuff in a while. And I think uh, of the 80s era slashers, this one is, I mean, what's most mind-blowing about this movie, and we'll talk about a lot of different stuff, but uh, there aren't any sequels to this film. Yeah, there's Can we none. just talk about that right away? There's no sequel. They did that remake, uh, the sure. 3D one. Sure, the 2009 um, one. But, yeah, no sequels. But what about My Bloody Valentine 2 or 3? Or for the final chapter. Yeah, why is this not or in a kill Five, Palooza? a bone to pick. I'm perplexed by this. It has the notoriety. Um, it's probably a Black Christmas kind of thing. Never saw a sequel to that yeah, either. Man. There were a bunch of the 80s slasher films that just, they never had franchises. Sure, but the thing is, is the, the, the weird thing about My Bloody Valentine mm-hmm. is it's so iconic and it's sure. so well put together and the packaging is so good. It's a holiday slasher. Yeah. I mean, holiday slashers are the easiest ones to do sequels sure, to. Sure. You take something like House on Sorority Row or Terror Train. Right. You can't really solidify how a sequel would come about. But you think April Fool's Day, there was a potential loss there? I We're not here to talk about that. Although they were packaged together for like 10 years. I my Bloody that, Valentine the, and April yeah. Fool's Day. The only way you could get My Bloody Valentine was by buying April Fool's as well. Well, yeah, that's back when the uh, the DVD was still the the cut version, you right? Know, for yeah. a long well, time. Well, they just a couple of years ago, right around the same time the remake came out, sure. they released the My Bloody Valentine Super Special Bloody Unrated Edition. Right, right. So you and I, for a drastic change of pace, we're always watching the unrated stuff on here. Uh, you and I decided, eh, well, let's watch the original cut. Sure. Now, I know you've been watching slasher stuff a lot longer than I have. I'd actually never seen the original cut. <laughs> That's how how widespread the uncut yeah. version is. For as many fucking times as I've seen this, I've always seen the unrated version with the extra footage. Right. And uh, I mean the you know the the footage that's lost from this movie is fucking legendary. Yeah. Everybody talks about this stuff. We've mentioned on the show a couple times. You know how how different the footage looks. Yeah, it looks a lot shittier because they didn't, you know, 
edit it. They pulled it out of a vault and yeah. slapped it in the film. At least they took the time to insert it into the correct part of the film. Yeah, that's, that's true. Good. I guess the uh, the cop out there would have just been to include it as deleted scenes or some shit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this was uh, this was sought after for a long time. We always think about that uncut version because that's just kind of the version that you know everybody talks about. But they uh, they had to cut the movie before it even hit the theater, obviously, for the MPAA. And for the longest time, the studio... I mean, this is a film from the 80s, and it's just a couple of years ago we right. finally saw the original film before all the sure. cuts happen. So years are going by, and the studio just refuses to put this out. They don't want right. to invest any time in it. And I think it's it's partially how much people clamored for that yeah. that might have led to the remake anyways. They said, well, how yeah. can we... How can we uh, just... We'll just do one giant My Bloody Valentine push all at once so we start to get, you know... All these fancy packages with the re-release and then the remake stuff and then 3D all kind of just hits in this onslaught, this uh, one year of My Body Valentine right. stuff. Well, all the deleted scenes too. I mean, it's a real shame that it got cut from the film mm. because in context, had they color corrected it and fixed everything and made sure. it look like real scenes in the film. Sure. The special effects, the practical effects stuff that they did, right. it's all really brutal. Yeah, it's amazing seeing this original version and how much less violent yeah. it is. Because it's only a couple minutes that are lost. Right. You know, the lost footage of this, it's talked about almost like uh, when we talked about London After Midnight. That mm -hmm. was just on uh, Freaks and The Straight right. Story the other day. But we were talking about London After Midnight being that movie, it's a lost film and no one's ever actually seen it. And the only copy was destroyed. And that's kind of how the footage was here, just because Paramount was keeping it under lock and key. Yeah. It's weird to, to see how the movie feels a little bit different. I mean, it effectively means you spend less time with the slasher. Right. Which is good in one way. It makes him much more enigmatic and uh, and really iconic because of that. Because every every brief glimpse you get of him is... Oh, here's the My Bloody Valentine Dark slash and heavy get, and quick. Yeah, right. And it's all him coming up on what will be uh, an absence of sure. violence in this version. But it also means that it is, as you said, less violent, which is a shame. But uh, if you're a fan of the, the movie and you've only seen one version, I would actually recommend just seeing the other version, too. Just, yeah. Just to kind of get a feel of that. A lot of My Bloody Valentine, for me, has always been about the feel. It's been about... Uh, you know, that, that 80s slasher mood, um, that thing that you, you know, the, the sleepaway camp stuff. Sure. And you mentioned fucking terror train. Right. right. But this is in a really great period of that. This is my favorite period of slashers is kind of very, very late 70s, very early 80, you know, 79 sure. to 81. That right. is my favorite right. period of slashers. Where they still, they still employ the use of first person slasher cam. Yeah. Where you get the point of view shots, yeah. the, uh, they're unaware of what's to come heavily in the 80s. Right. You know, the late 70s, that was Black Christmas and Halloween. But then into the 80s, that's where you start getting into the franchise stuff. Sure, you start, in. getting, you start getting Jason Takes Manhattan. Absolutely. Freddy plays Nintendo. Sure. Well, that's, yeah, that's the late stuff. But even, you know, the early stuff right. is Friday the 13th. That's right about the same time as this. And then they turn that into a franchise. Well, what's great about this is it's the same thing as with Black Christmas. These are, uh, they're very serious films at the time. The tone is a lot darker because yeah. of how serious, they're trying to be horrifying. Right. Well, it's, it's not, they're not quite, like you said, it's not established as a fun thing for the, for teenagers sure, to sure. go and make out to. Although My Bloody Valentine in slasherdom does have such a perfect setup for a slasher it certainly film. certainly does, yeah. Because it's Valentine's Day. That's when kids actually party and have sex, yeah, which right. are key components to killing off a bunch of teenagers. Well, all holidays are like that. Well, though. you think Isn't that every holiday when an was the last for kids time, to party and Do have sex? you really think of Halloween as the night you get laid? Uh, I don't really have a specific night of the year. I'm just that. saying you don't actually. Think I think of April Fool's Day as the night I get laid. That's but that's you know for different reasons. My birthday is on April Fool's Day. No one's going to know what we're talking but about. But Valentine's Day, I mean, that is the night you get laid. You expect kids to be horny, and you expect kids to be wanting yeah, to have a Yeah, you know what I expect time. is everybody to have those terrible fucking chocolate boxes around. Yeah, full of uh No, those shit. things are terrible. Yeah. Why do people like boxes of chocolates? I think, I don't know. Would you not rather have a mountain of candy, of literally any candy, than a box uh, of chocolate? Pretty much, yeah. They're filled with all this, oh God, I fucking hate box chocolates. <laughs> 
So, you know, you, you're missing that comedy component a lot from the right. early. I wouldn't well, even no, say that. Have, I think they're have, still funny. They're well, just more sincere. They're not maybe as intentional. You have funny. Howard. Howard is the comic relief in my Yeah, but Valentine. he's more the, hey, everybody, come on, chill out. This is I a party. Let's have a good time. So much. I'm always ecstatic when his head falls off. You want a point of view shot of him dying is what you're craving. Yeah, the first person stuff, the point of view stuff. The um, My favorite one from this one is... Obviously, you have the laundry room one. The laundry room, whatever. Is... Let's decorate the laundry room with right. Valentine's Day. Uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but the um, the longer point of view shot when they're going into the mine, yeah. it's not even really so much a point of view shot. It's just there's no characters in it. It's um, I mean, I'm really I've developed in the the last year or two this this love of really slow tracking shots that yeah. back out of scenes. Uh-huh. I can't quite put my finger on why yet. But when you're you're slowly leaving a room and exiting and the camera's a little low and you're especially going down into a mine, you're leaving safety. You know, you're going into the, the treacherous area, but it's not slowly pushing you in. Instead, you're seeing yourself pulled out of, oh, there's above ground and there's safety and there's where everything was OK. Uh, now you're going to be fucked. Well, and the mine shaft and the whole minor dynamic, I mean, Harry Warden. Sure. And the whole mythology yeah. is just, it's another, I mean, we already talked about how they didn't make sequels. Sure. And I feel like having such a evil, menacing fucking slasher like Harry Warden and his, his domain is dark caves. Right. Yeah. And he has a flashlight on his head. I mean, sure. he is a scary motherfucker. Right. I would watch Harry Warden smashing light bulbs in a <laughs> sure. mine for an hour and a half. Yeah. You could make a sequel of just Harry Warden smashing light bulbs. Oh, well, I mean, the killer is so boss that you're right. The The scene where he's going through and just knocking out the lights, it's perfect. The whole mining aspect of this is part of that really distinctive character. It's, you know, we've talked a lot of times about um, Bright Falls and Alan Wake that it was sure. kind of in promotion to. Alan Wake is is thought of in the same way as Bright Falls as being very Twin Peaksy, you know. But a lot of that, in honesty, was mining towns and you know people who kind of worked in the blue collar industry and that sort of stuff. That kind of aesthetic isn't used very often. It's, um, I mean, I did just to look at Alan Wake and Bright Falls. Bright Falls barely picked up any of that. The uh, I think it was called Poets of the Fall, the music video thing they did for Alan Wake used it even more. But, you know, the movie, uh, My Bloody Valentine, actually films in a mine, which must have been a complete pain in the ass. But it does so much for that atmosphere. You know, I feel like it's almost unfair. We come on here and we kind of go, oh, 80 Slasherdom, isn't that great? And it's, hey, it's like Black Christmas. And we even get a detective. And sure. there's a holiday theme. Holiday theme, of course, being, I mean, after Friday the 13th, there's a very deliberate emphasis on that stuff. Or the uh, the riddles. That was another part of yeah. The 80s slasher thing. Here we have a little bit less. Uh, it's an element of mystery. Oh, is this killer coming back? And, you know, it's sure. funny. We call him Harry Warden, but there's that whole obvious turn at right. the end that happens. You just think about him as that character. Well, and the whole film goes out of its way to still pretend that it matters who the killer is. Right. right. That's another thing that. Well, don't all the slasher movies do that? Well, eventually, Does like it ever you said, really matter? when you get to the mid and late 80s, you know it's Jason, yeah. it's Freddy, it's Chucky, it's usually, Michael it's usually. Michael Myers. Yeah, that's true. Unless it's Halloween 3 or that fucking ambulance driver. But in the initial, you know, the advent of slasher films, there's still this intrinsic need for the whodunit, this yeah. desire to. It's not slasher is not a genre right at this point in time it's a horror film yeah it's a it's a murder mystery almost sure so they red herring every single fucking character right. could it be the cop on his patrol yeah or is it tj who's back in town for the first time in sure. oh say sure. 20 years and now there's murder what's what's going on over here horror is still and, kind of finding itself for that that era sure and and without fail you always watch these films now we do i don't know if people did in the 80s double feature show at gmail.com but you watch it nowadays and try to find the least conspicuous character sure. because you know that's who it's going to end up being yeah. yeah but i mean the point i was driving at is that for everything that you know we think about this as a both a perfect example of you know a yeah. typical 80 slasher film but also one of the most distinctive ones sure it has uh some of the most character 
the kind of opening and the stillness in there uh it's it's weird there's these icons the breathing sound the right absence of score during some of the most climactic parts just so you can get that kind of respirator mine shaft right. you know oxygen sound and that continues through the uh the movie i mean the score itself is for a large part reserved for the uh, the more tender moments sure. and less the kills right it's there sometimes it's it's there's, uh, there's, the, there's your banjo bluegrass score when well, uh, quitting time yeah quitting right time. but that's what i mean it's more yeah. for the sure the funny the light scenes the bar scenes it's always bar death or curse. mine in this uh it's for the death curse scenes. yeah in this movie but when you think about it in contrast to something like halloween right which a lot of people cite as especially for the franchise as being you know one of the big origins that's all music kills. That's all, oh, yeah. hey, well, creepy John music. Carpenter. Yeah, right. He doesn't let up on the keys for a second. And then, of course, there's the Canadian accents, oh, which my God. also add character. You want to talk about a fucking character, though. You're right. Death Curse guy. In the scenes when we're not in the mine, which means we're always in the fucking bar, the Death Curse guy... So there's a couple of things that are unique about this character for being, again, a, a spin. It's weird to call it a spin on a cliche that didn't exist yet. Right. You know, it's as if everybody took... The cliche has started spinning at yeah, this point. They didn't take any of the distinctive parts. They just... Took, maybe it's the opposite, though. Maybe Death Curse was, uh, was formed out of characters like this, and the parts that weren't picked up as part of the cliche look distinct to us now. But at the time, sure. you probably didn't go, oh, he stares into the camera all the time. That's right. a weird thing. I guess the Death Curse guy still kind of does that sometimes. So we talked a little bit about eyeline matching, I think, on um, on the Cronenberg show, mm. on the uh, history of violence uh, when we did that movie on the show. I was talking about kind of, you know, how your character will stare into the empty two thirds of the frame uh, at, let's say, a 45 degree angle. And then you'll cut to over the shoulder, the other character staring back into the opposite side of the screen, his two thirds of the empty frame at that same 45 degree angle. And that's how you, you get this implied, it's called eyeline matching. It's just a way to imply that your characters are speaking to one another. Sure. But in this movie, everybody's staring off into a 45 degree angle, looking over at the bartender. And then the bartender is basically staring directly <laughs> into the camera and he narrates the flashback, sure. which is... Strange. You get a flashback of, oh, what's going on? So it's right. exposition via flashback via death curse. But he also has the, the little twist where he's going to show them. He'll play a, a mean joke. Uh, he gets involved, and that's kind of the another. It's a red herring. It's is the, is the death curse guy actually Harry Warden? It's just all these characters have so many levels, which is just something that eventually got lost in slasherdom. Even the, the cop, the Ahab... Uh, he's actually a human. Sure. He's not gun toting, coming out, knows sure. everything about the situation, and he'll show up when it's necessary. Right. He's confused. He's scared. He doesn't have any idea what's going on. He's not bumbling, but he's misinformed. He doesn't know about the party. He He's doing his job. He's actually a fucking cop. Yeah, you know, you're right. I never think about the other characters from this movie, ever. Yeah. Because... The, the Harry Warden or not Harry Warden is... Sure, that's really... I mean, it's such a great... Just the look and the feel and, you know, you, you go to a movie like this and you get really excited for the those parts, but those other characters are a lot different too. And I guess that was kind of similar in Black Christmas. Yeah. Whether it's an accident or not, at this point, we will look back and we will say, you know, bravo movies, way to have very distinctive <laughs> characters as well. You had to remember too, I mean... We talk about uh, the violence being cut out and, you know, they kept putting this back through for the MPAA. Uh, back in those times, that wasn't, uh, I don't think, as offensive to the... No, fuck that. It was offensive to the filmmakers. Sure. I'm sure they were upset about it. But these movies, to remember back to them, the slasher movies, they weren't often made for the purposes of art. Right. You know, they were made uh, to... They have less of a cash in appearance now. They don't look like exploitation. But these films were kind of looked down upon. Yeah. These were the cheap way to make a buck. I mean, Friday the 13th is infamously known as the movie that was made to keep the lights on. Right. They had no idea that was a franchise. Sure. Which is funny because that really helps make it a cash cow. Sure. But it was almost a, a kind of quiet shame to be working in a yeah. genre like this that we can now look back and pay so much tribute to. Well, it's because it was so formulaic and so easy and so... Cheap thrills, right? Yeah, that exactly. was why it was I looked mean, down on. You, you go in and it's it's dime thrills. You're right. You It's 
teens, tits, and blood. Mm -hmm. And that's especially in the late 70s, early 80s, before, you know, before exploitation became okay to love for teens and tits and blood and sure. fast cars and right. high octane. That was still, you know, that was when Scorsese was hitting it big. That was when, you know, just post Godfather. Yeah. These are, that was, I mean, that it very much, that was the heyday of classic cinema. Sure. Taxi Driver, Scarface, you know, the films that people regard as great movies mm -hmm. coming out mixed with My Bloody Valentine. Having your name on something like My Bloody Valentine around then, that's definitely not. Sure. It's not going up on, it's not going up over your mantle. Poltergeist, on the other hand, would then be that kind of hybrid of blockbuster and horror film. Yeah, absolutely. And also starts with the national fucking right. anthem. Yeah. Really? I like the, the second time they come back to the national anthem, that TV white noise is like a fucking bomb going off yeah. at the end. It's, uh, it's something that just very post-apocalyptic about it. The national anthem plays and then the bomb goes off. I feel like I'm going to steal that for something somewhere in the future. Um, I'll have to tag it in this episode so I can remember when I came up with that idea. Good plan. And by came up with, I mean steal from Poltergeist. So kind of just like how Toby Hooper stole the film from <laughs> Steven Spielberg. Yeah, you know, that's, I don't know what happened there. I don't either. Yeah, it's it's funny, right? It, it, it's definitely yeah, I mean, funny. Really, that, I think at the basic level, know. that is what it is. Because Steve, I, I had never... I've seen Poltergeist. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay attention to the opening credits sure. because I knew the one name, which was Toby Hooper. And it's no secret on Double Feature that as a horror guy, uh -huh. I don't have very high regard. Well, for here's Toby why. Hooper. I'll tell I'll tell everybody why. This is very very clear, and sure. you can tell me how close I get to this. Of all the directors we cover, and we like talking about directors and yeah. understand them and getting them. Toby Hooper, I don't think, especially for as well regarded and as much as he's thrown in with these other big horror. Takashi Miike, John Carpenter kind of sure. names. That's my that's my uh, like forty year span. Yeah, of, that's a good. I, I'm impressed. He doesn't have a, a distinct style. No, uh, of his own. He makes a lot of uh, pretty well known movies. Yeah, but I mean, what, look at fucking Texas Chainsaw Massacre right. and then Poltergeist. That those two movies are made allegedly by the same person. <laughs> Can well, you believe that? Yeah, well, the thing that I... Yeah, it's... Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we talked about it on the show. Mm -hmm. We love that film. Yeah. That's a great film. But it's an art house film. Yeah. When you look at uh, Poltergeist, it's as much adventure, or fantasy, or certainly science fiction as any of these. And it's hard to make that claim because it's, it's monsters and ghosts and sure. dead people and whatever attacking these people. There's really nothing sci-fi about it. No, but we're opening TV. we're opening gates to other dimensions. Yeah, it's you know true. what I mean. It doesn't uh, the way it goes about it. It is a pretty strict ghost story, but you can't shake the feeling of fantasy or adventure right. from it. So the thing that happened with Spielberg is is weird because when you watch this movie, you just see Steven Spielberg. I mean, I think that's where this claim probably comes from mostly. But sure. So the uh, the the backstory here is essentially that. Toby Hoover got the directing credit on this. And he Steven is, Spielberg got every other credit. Right. He well, producer, screenwriter, right? He's the um, you know, the kind of behind the scenes man. A lot of people will allege that Steven Spielberg actually directed this movie. That this is as much his movie as, you know, fucking E. T. Yeah. And I don't know I mean, I don't know if this is a conspiracy or if this is something we can actually kind of look at. Because there's just not enough evidence for it. Right. And there's so much of people want this to be a Spielberg movie, and it does feel like a Spielberg movie, that, you know, it's it's really easy to just go, oh, I could kind of see how the moon landing was fake, and wouldn't it be convenient? Yeah. And then I would know a cool little secret nobody else knows. Sure. And, you know, that's our, our tendency as human beings right. to believe in conspiracy. But when you look back to a couple of the interviews with people at the time, they all said Toby Hooper was a little bit loopy on uh -huh. the set, maybe had some drug influence, might not have worked day in and day out at the uh, the critical decision-making stuff the way Spielberg did. But that doesn't make him any less of a director than sure. you know when a producer has a strong role, right. has a strong say in what a movie's doing. Well, I think for me, the, the biggest discrepancy from Toby Hooper films mm. is that Poltergeist seems so safe. Does, and I yeah. know I kind of went off on, at the end of the film, I went off on a little bit of a rant while we were watching. I'm sorry I made you sit through that whole thing because I, I got a little frustrated. But Toby Hooper made a film after Texas Chainsaw, 
mm. um, called Eaten Alive, which was about a guy who fed people to alligators. Sure. You know, in Kill Bill, uh, my name's Buck and I'm here to fuck. Sure. That line is taken from Eaten Alive. Yeah. Uh, Robert England is Buck in Eaten Alive. Oh, beautiful. Anyway, Toby Hooper is violent. He's dark. He's violent. He's gory. He's uh, He's very much a horror director well we want to thank toby hooper is that sure. but who knows what toby hooper is that's very true but spielberg is not that's not his go-to that's not mm. where he lives and that's not the realm that his films live in uh which is probably why he's a lot more of a popular director and why the wider audience will go to a spielberg film sure and poltergeist is so safe no one is ever really in danger a family is separated sure that becomes the stake of the film is that a little girl is away from her mommy. And then toward the end, when things seem really intense and there's explosions and more lights flashing, sure. bodies coming out of the ground, not attacking anybody. Right. The you, I mean, you loved it, but yeah. really the most dangerous thing to happen is a giant pillar of fire spouts out of somebody's front yard, but no one gets hurt. It Fire safety is very important, man. I know. I understand that. But the film is really safe and the stakes are really low. They just so do you don't a mean good it doesn't job. have horror moments no, or not that, at the, all. that the film is safe, but the content of the, the things happening in the film this sure. is a fairly safe journey. The stakes are so low. They right. just do a really good job of, of translating the intensity being caught forever in another dimension. That doesn't, that doesn't bother you. Not really. You would be totally fine with that. She seemed okay. As long as you can podcast from that dimension, I don't think it would change our lives much. You might have to go back to a tube television kill me the strobe light tv there are a lot of moments that you know that do have some really genuine scares to them or really i mean it's creepy as fuck the eye shine and when she's first sitting in front of the tv yeah. and it's showing her and it's just flickering uh i don't often think oh there's a creepy child this is really working sure very frequently i see that in a movie and say fuck you movie you think you can just put a kid in here right. and turn the lights off and it's scary right but this is one of the uh the few times it's, it's truly unique i really do feel that way well it's hypnotic and plus there's yeah. that that um the iconic mm. we're here line for me that's just uh that's just the opening line to primus's frizzle fry record okay but to most people that i thought my bloody valentine would be your first music reference on this show oh, well I, I i blew that one didn't i what's well, that scene i mean the parents torture these children sure. with with scary devices yeah <laughs> you know the fucking tree out the window oh i, mean, I love the tree chop that thing down what I are love, you doing i love that tree or the scary clown i mean why do you why is that even there they're just fucking asking for it. He covers, I love this, he covers the scary clown with uh, what is somehow the scariest Chewbacca I've ever seen. <laughs> Why is that Chewbacca so terrifying? They just can't win these poor people. I love their parents, though. I mean, that's one oh, of my yeah. favorite things about this movie. Uh, Diane and Steve, they are, uh, they're essentially teenagers. Sure. You know, they're um, pot smoking and carrying on. They they're diving off the fucking bed, you know. Diane's always wearing short shorts and uh, laughing at, you know, her daughter cursing out the construction workers outside. I mean, they're right. in their hearts. They're very, very youthful people. Nothing about them is proper. I'm so used to seeing that in films with children. I think sure. that's what makes me not like the children is that, you know, I see children in a film and I know, wow, now there's no one I can relate to. Right. Because they're going to have parents and I'm not going to like those people either because they were proper enough to have kids. Occasionally, though, you will meet people in your life who are cool parents. Yeah. And uh, and these people, for as little as I have in common with them, are cool parents. Uh, Diane's punk haircut would have, you know, kept her a, a little bit over the edge. But I, she you had a thing going on there, right? It was Rogue from X-Men. Yeah, for sure. Why would you want to get rid of that? I don't know. I love that uh, she also describes her experience as being akin to a hangover at the end. Yeah. That's how you know we've gone through a journey We've learned nothing. <laughs> no character growth. I don't always want character growth. That's fine. No, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I feel like sometimes people are strong enough to be themselves through a situation. Yeah, you don't want to change if you like who you are. These people don't. You could say their poor parenting is a flaw, but I don't know that they're poor parents. They rescue their kids from hell or other sure. world or limbo. or. I Yeah, I think their real flaw is... Uh, going to people who use ectometers and oh my god you're reading my mind the whole fucking i think it's because we were talking about responsibility of ghostbusters jesus fuck the uh the kind of effects and spookery of this movie <laughs> i mean they're, it's divided and it. do you like that it's divided in in two kind of areas there are the um 
the painted on uh, effects. Sure. And then there are the very practical effects. Mm-hmm. And I love the the theater of the practice. I love just seeing you walk into a room and it's not even really an effect. It's some stacked chairs. Yeah. You had a prop guy glue chairs together and put them on a table. And for me, that's one of the best effects in the yeah, movie. Yeah, for sure. It's that practical stuff. I like the the sliding chair that comes across. Yeah. All the stuff playing around in the, the kitchen, the, right? The, um, I like the crawling steak. I'm a big fan yeah, of the crawling steak. Good. I'm also, I know it's a, it's kind of, uh, it's a really obvious moment Mm -hmm. but when the skull comes out of the closet and almost eats steve right that to me is just this horrifying don't fuck with the closet moment yeah right (laughs) that just i it just sticks with me well there's a lot of that stuff i mean i I think about the chairs because of that one scene but there's also the scene where you know the the kid gets up from bed or whatever and the chair is it's the real world stand-in for the ghost right it's the uh there's a chair staring at him I mean, that's where I do start to see the more Texas Chainsaw, Toby Hooper stuff. Right. If we uh, if we could have gone through the entire movie doing that, then I would really say, you know, those signatures seem a lot more similar to me. The fancier stuff is good, too, though. There's, I mean, one of my favorite Vertigo shots is in this movie. Well, they uh, they do the Vertigo shot, and then she runs down the hallway, and they do the Vertigo they shot They Vertigo again. and then try and follow her yeah. a little bit. Yeah, just the effect of using that in a hallway. Yeah. Anytime you're doing a vertigo shot sure. in a corridor, that's well. And they have the the lighting; it's sectional lighting down mm-hmm. the walls yeah. with the you know the door frame at the sure, end. It's sure. really it looks awesome. It looks fucking cool. The other thing they make use of is really one of the oldest examples I can think of: the rolling reverse delay. Uh, this gets a little more technical, but we do the engineering for mm-hmm. our show as well as all the other stuff our producers not doing. <laughs> So uh, a lot of people don't know this. We wrote the theme, you and I. Yeah. Uh, we recorded that. I think we talk about it on something like the third episode or something pretty far back. But uh, one of the effects to make all those little clips, we wrote, you wrote, and I recorded those sure. clips, just people we know. Right. And so they don't actually come from movies. Yeah, they're, they're not, not actually from movies. Sampled. We made them up. But to make them sound more like samples, we applied a lot of engineering stuff to it. So uh, one of the things that's on there, I think it's on the... Um, are you afraid of things that go boom kind of line yeah. in the middle there that drops out? There's that rolling reverse delay. And you can hear it in here when uh, when Caroline's talking from the TV. It's an echo, but it's also kind of backwards. Right. That's the, the reverse aspect of it, I suppose. Sure. Done in a like way it, where it's timed. That I, It's just a very unique effect. Right. It sounds like the vocals on the Blood Flowers record. Now the Cure. Still I'm don't sorry. want to mention my bloody Valentine. I'll you're going for an ambient record, and you're still end. not going to talk about my bloody Valentine. <laughs> so while we're over here in our low budget studio using computers and other forms, also of, not haunted, should mention. Right, in another area of the world, um, conveniently not haunted. There's a bunch <laughs> of ghost hunters pretending that that is right. the case. Uh, still using the fucking sliding chair trick from Poltergeist. guys. Right, right. They just steal their nonsense out yeah, of movies. It's so dumb. Well, it, it's just, I mean, I feel like they go and they watch something like Paranormal Activity 3 mm. and figure out how they can do that now. You know, part of that uh, I blame on film. You can't actually blame art for things like this, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> the the treatment of like movie, Columbine? Yeah, see, now you're making me feel really bad I'm about sorry. this. I'm sorry. Uh, the movie has no ethical responsibility to mock ghost hunters. That's just what I would do. Right. I'm not going to blame anybody sure. for that. But they treat these ghost hunters. I mean, that's what we do in cinema. We make larger than life characters. We treat and then these we tear ghost their hunters faces off. Yeah. You might be thinking, oh, larger than life characters. These ghost hunters aren't really larger than life. But if you've ever met one of the scumbags that actually cons people out of money or goes on TV pretending the world is in a way, in a reality in which it is not, fuck those people. Self-delusional or otherwise, fuck those people. This movie treats ghost hunters as if they're um, they're far more legitimate than sure. they are, and that's part of the fiction. But you know, the the ghost hunters in here they they look specifically more responsible mm-hmm. than actual ghost hunters are. Actual, that's air quotes. <laughs> actual ghost hunters, actual fake ghost hunters. There you go. You know, like the the scene where it shows them all they're talking amongst themselves when they're talking amongst themselves and no one else is around. They're either A, playing pretend and talking in character. I'm, again, speaking about real world ghost hunters here. Or B, talking about how to divide up the money that they're stealing from these. I'm not a very cynical person. I think they're often self-deluded or they like playing pretend. I think that's why ghost hunters do that. But they're having this very private conversation about, oh, you know, we have to make sure 
we isolate this so it's not structural leakage that's causing the equipment to malfunction. I mean, ghost hunters don't have that conversation. Right. They scan your wall until they find some poor copper wiring and some old electricity, and then they claim it's ghosts. <laughs> or they say, you know, this can't be seen by the naked eye, so let's use time-lapse photography. Yeah. Did no one on the set know what time-lapse photography is? I guess not. It was a time-lapse camera. It wasn't time-lapse photography. Oh, well, that's fine. Maybe it's just the time-lapse cam they use that happens to have infrared or spectral analysis i believe what a time or, lapse camera films is stuff happening over time that's precisely what it does so the only way they would catch ghosts using a time lapse camera is if the ghost showed up once every four or five days <laughs> and you didn't want to sit around bored as you usually do if you go on a real life joe nickel-esque uh, sure. ghost expedition you often spend your your time sitting around bored in a haunted house What you really see in the real world is uh, a mixed bag of practical tricks that these people use to give the illusion that there's, you know, it's a fake seance, right? They're doing this. It's uh, The Last Exorcism. When we watch The Last Exorcism. Perfect. uh, That was exposing what ghost hunters slash witch doctors slash whatever pseudoscience nonsense uh, is actually using. So the first place they go for help is their neighbors, which... It's funny to me, looking at this, uh, we were just talking about the the Welcome to the Dollhouse kind of suburbs right. thing and how there's things in the suburbs that just aren't like things in the city. One of them is going to your neighbors. That's true. If something weird was happening in my building, unless it's a leak, I can't go upstairs and talk to the right. guy up there. You're just, you're bothering them. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, I, I actually, I mean, I live, uh, I live in a three flat. It's sure. not, you know, you live in a building and I live in a three flat. I'm always in buildings with thousands of occupants. Sure. And I prefer, I prefer, you know, smaller buildings, yeah, smaller right. management. It's just, it's a preference thing. Yeah. But what that leads to is knowing your building mates because there's six people, right? Sure, sure. I still wouldn't go to them for anything. No, you can't. I wouldn't hate. go to them for the proverbial cup of sugar. I would walk right. to CVS down the street and buy an entire bag. Well, that's because you're a capitalist and not a fucking hippie. I'm sorry, let's keep the anger directed towards the ghost hunters and not towards hippies. We can do that on another show. As everyone breathes a collective sigh of relief that I didn't manage to get Alice shrugged on year four. (laughs) Sorry, everyone. Fingers crossed for next year. So when the neighbors fail, uh, and perhaps more important than really any other actor in this film, even the charming dog that adds a oh strange amount a, of it's a character dog. to the dog gets its own scene. I mean, it is just as much as sliding in the kitchen is one of the, the iconic family moments, you know, having the dog around Zelda Rubenstein. Yes. Is in poltergeist. No, we've seen her on the show before we have, uh, in her last film role, I believe her last film role, uh, in behind the mask, right? Maybe one of my favorite of her roles. Sure. Uh, Poltergeist, I don't feel like is, for as much as that is her iconic role, I don't think it's a very good representation of the way I imagine uh, Zelda in Agreed. a lot of these movies. Well, because she's not in her own. She She's uh, she's still kind of acting sure. as opposed to <laughs> being creepy. Sure. She yeah. has this natural, it's a charisma, but it's a very dark charisma. It is. Um, and Poltergeist, maybe because of the Spielbergism, the Spielberg esqueness of it. Right, right. She needs to be family friendly. Yeah. She needs to have her I am clairvoyant moment. Um, you know, the cute sure. quips and the personability that comes with being in a family situation. I really always imagine her alone in a rocking chair sure. or in a creepy room. Well, see, you imagine Tales from the Crypt, uh, Zelda Rubenstein. Right. I imagine Taste the Rainbow, Zelda Rubenstein. <laughs> you know, she did a lot of voiceover work, too, a little bit of Nickelodeon stuff. I mean, I don't think of Zelda the same way I think of someone like uh, Richard Really, who is, you know, Richard sure. Really, you depend on to be Richard Really because yeah. you love Richard Really. Yep. That's who you want out of him. Uh, I think Zelda has a little bit of muscle. Sure. You know, she can, in a role like this, I mean, she's smaller than all her other... Right. I've, I mean, physically, the movie <laughs> makes her shorter than all her other parts. And she's got those weird aviator glasses, you know, that you remember back from this. But that's not how I remember her. I remember her from her creepy kind of behind-the-mask roles or the other side of her work, which is the Skittles Taste the Rainbow voice, you know, that kind of voiceover work stuff. Same creepy voice does two totally different things. (laughs) Zelda was one of the people who is part of, you know, the curse of poltergeist. Sure. I mean, I don't want to, at the risk of setting up a straw man, I'm not going to include her in this because I don't often hear her name thrown around. But 
a bunch of people from the Poltergeist movies have died. Yeah, well, a bunch of people from a lot of movies have died, Eric. I feel In like fact, we've covered this before. I believe if you go back to a film like, say, Citizen Kane, sure. almost everyone from Citizen Kane has died. Well, that's because of the curse of Orson Welles. Right. You know, Orson Welles himself once died. What? So I know I know a lot about the Poltergeist curse. I know that sure. um, the little uh, uh, Carol Ann... Sure. Uh, I know that she was one of the victims and the other one, and this is an actual brutal, horrible thing. And it really affected me when I read about it. The older sister, did you read about how she yeah, died? Yeah, right. Strangled. By her boyfriend in yeah. her driveway. Yeah. And people are writing this off as a curse. I know. How fucking belittling is that? I know. It really is. It's awful. I feel so bad. Can you imagine her family? If, if I somebody, can't, no. I mean, it's terrible. She gets murdered by her boy by a jealous boyfriend, and the majority of people are going, oh, that's what you get for being in a scary movie. Yeah, right. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. Yeah, man, I feel like it was the Rosemary's Baby show that yeah. maybe we talked about this, where, yeah, people died in the production or whatever. Those are the two people who died uh, in a little bit more horrific ways yeah i mean the other it's only four people it's four people in three films first of all yeah if you don't count zelda which i don't because she died two goddamn years ago or whatever and she was old well the other two people were in their 50s or 60s sure but the know, two, the, yeah the only two that really even struck me as anything to know was the two little girls yeah that's true because it's untimely yeah. so two untimely deaths in three movies or in one movie if you want to give them the credit it's uh they used human skeletons in the pool scene and everybody threw a big fit you know, the, the lead actress, I mean, you can go on, if you go on like the Hollywood tours, uh, haunted graveyard, whatever thing, they visit her tomb and there's this longstanding thing about how she haunts one of the Paramount lots. I mean, one of the guys who died of the four was diagnosed with cancer before this fucking movie even came into fruition. Yeah. Before he was even cast for the part. So the whole thing is... Much like conspiracy theories, it's one of those, ah, fun to talk about if you don't know anything else about Poltergeist. Except it's a lot more fucking insensitive. It really is. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really worked up over it, but that's just because I just... Domestic violence drives me insane. Yeah, pretty fucked up. And I think we should end there. We have a website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, and then you mentioned the email address being doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. That is the email address that I, at least the one that I'm informed of. If you'd rather not end on a downer note, actually, uh, you know what a really good show to refer people to for all the stuff we were talking about today would probably be the Amityville Killapalooza. Yeah. I know I mentioned that Rosemary's Baby show, but if you haven't gotten into a Killapalooza yet and you are just going to cheat and not watch the films and just listen to one. Yeah. Uh, head over from this show to the Amityville one, <laughs> where we'll be doing some more serious haunted house work in the uh, name of skepticism. All right, so next time we're going to cover some fantasy. We're going to cover some uh, some weirdness and some funness. Um, George Lucas and uh, Neil Gaiman, huh? Yeah, well, and, and we're going to get a little Jim Henson. And to be completely fair and honest and to warn everybody, we're going to get a little Gervais, but it's going to be in a sure. different way this time. When you say a little Gervais, is that a pun? Uh, no. So the movies are going to be Willow and Mirror Mask. And I'm really excited, so watch more fucking film. Bye.